First question I have for you is just a little bit of um, a background on your project, just so that people um, can listen to us and without seeing your project, what is kind of like the basic quick description of your project? So the basic quick description I would say is um, how the like what it how the development of the Avalon Emo, like how did it affect different sectors of our economy and the government and other political issues and like how was and then I tried to look at if the cancellation had a negative or positive effect on those sectors. Okay, that sounds really interesting. Um, personally, reading about your project, I'd never actually heard of the Avro Arrow because um, I know you mentioned in your project, it's kind of like, I guess, a, a forgotten piece of history. Um, so it was really interesting for me to read about it because I hadn't heard, heard of it. Um, so on that note, how yeah. did you end up choosing your project topic? Um, I came across because I was, I was just looking at the CBC archives. I was going across um, some Cold War tapes that they had. And then they had one of the, like a test flight, a taxi flight of the AML. And I thought the plane looked cool and then I just looked it up. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an awesome answer. Um, I love when you can kind of just like see something that you're interested in. And then once you do a little bit more research, the topic expands so much and you can make a really great heritage or project on it. Um, yeah. so in terms of, um, I guess because your topic, I would say is a little, like it's a little more unique and not everybody knows about it. And then also because um, it ended up getting destroyed at the end, um, Avro Arrow. How do you think your topic compares to other historical events that happened in Canada? And why do you think it's significant for others to know that piece of history? I think it's significant because the government put so much money into it and so much energy and they hired so many engineers. And then in the end when they canceled it and they let all the engineers go, it was, it was like the plane actually had potential, you know, according to multiple books. And also just, even the government later on admitted that, you know, it could have been used for other purposes. And I feel like it's important to know so we don't repeat it. You know, a lot of, especially te technological projects that the government takes on, they often boast about it. The difference with the AOL is that it was quite um, classified. So like even just now, this guy came out with the blueprints and it was hiding in his basement for like 65 years. <laughs> and so yeah, I found that interesting. And I think that a lot of the projects that are heavily advertised, they receive a lot of criticism, but the ones that aren't, they kind of go, you know, under the radar, mm -hmm. both metaphorically and literally. So do you think because it was kind of developed under the radar and people didn't really find out about it until later on, um, how much impact do you think it had on like the development of aircrafts in Canada, either commercially or, um, for like protection or war? Yeah, because, um, so when we, like when we started developing it in 52, 53, we kind of, it was, it was the beginning of the Cold War. So we, at the time we probably thought it was just gonna be our one shot and then we had to make a good aircraft, make a statement, and then we could start from there and maybe form different partnerships with the US and stuff because until then we had basically been leaning on them for support. Mm -hmm. And so, we developed it and the thing is what I found is that I think what well, what was the question again? I completely forgot. Sorry. I got lost. The question just um how do you think the Avro Arrow contributed to the development of like aviation in Canada? Okay, so yeah. Um so it, 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 it was our one shot and then we hired this company which was AV called A V Low. Um, and they have been, they have, they were extremely experienced. For example, in the first world war, they made the Avro 504, which is a really cute plane. It's like a little biplane and it was a thousand models produced. And so we had all the foundations that were needed to produce a good aircraft. There were many technological aspects of the plane, such as, you know, many factors that reduced drag. It could go over Mark 0.2, which was, which definitely competed with the Cold War missiles of the day. Mm -hmm. And we de developed it under the threat of the Soviet missile styles and with the idea that we wanted to surpass speed and um, structure capability. And then um, when, when it was cancelled, it kind of ruined all hopes for the Cold War. I mean, once the public saw that we had wasted all that money, there was so much outcry about it that they said, just don't waste any more. Like we don't have any trust in the government. Mm 
-hmm. And that actually led to Prime Minister Dieter Bakers fall in 1963, when he was re not re-elected. The whole election of 1963 was focused on the Apple era. Wow, that's amazing. I had no idea it was such like a pinnacle of both Canadian politics and during the Cold War. Um, so I know you said how you chose your topic is um, you just kind of saw the airplane and were, was really interested in it. Do you have any um, personal relation to choosing the Avro era as your topic or um, any passion for like going into either aircraft design or being a pilot or anything like that? Um, I'm really interested in like just knowing, I, 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 I like um, different national projects, especially when they come to, uh, concern national defense. Mm -hmm. And I found it cool that, you know, they were completely destroyed, but yet, I said, oh, it had potential. And then especially since they were, I found that if you went on the surface, not many news articles, but if you go into um, government databases, they definitely archived and digitized a lot of them. And I felt like I learned a lot more. So my, I, I'm not really like in the aviation industry, but I'm more concerned about you know, history in general, especially CAS history. And I just thought of school that since there was material on it, I feel like I could I could do a project that's a bit more unique and I can actually get government documents that concern my project. Mm -hmm, that's great. Um, so kind of relating to the government documents, um, a big part of the research experience in Heritage Fair is finding um, reliable sources and like multiple sources to confirm the same piece of information. Um, so what was the most valuable resource resource of information for your project? Um, I got a few books from the Vancouver Public Library. I got a few from the, not many, but there were a few from the 80s and the 90s. So these, those were like second yeah, resources, like second, what do you call them, second sources? resources and um, like not written from the, from the perspective of 1959. So I found those interesting things. A lot of the authors had really, you know, one, one had an extreme conservative opinion saying that it was good to cancel the project. And the other thought more liberally and then looked at the different um, possibilities of the aircraft. So I felt like uh, the, the books were good because they gave a different perspective. And then if I looked at the government documents, for example, I'll post one in the chat. If I'm, if I look at the government documents, they were definitely extremely biased. So I did have a lot of trouble finding information that provided two sides of the story, like, you know, benefits of can cancellation or the benefit of not canceling it. Mm -hmm. I think you, you touched on a really good point there um, about bias in looking at different resources because it's really hard to find a source that isn't biased and that's why it's so important to use multiple sources so good for you for being able to point that out um you talked about how bias was a challenge for your project do you think it was the biggest challenge when doing your research or did you also come across other challenges um i feel like the other challenge i found was finding enough information about the bone mark missile mm -hmm. because i think that back then there wasn't as much focus on recording information as there is now because everything's digitized now. So I didn't find much on the specs of the bone mark. I only found one document, which I asked to post in the chat, on the relation between the bone mark and Canada. And I had to look at a CBC documentary about the installation of the bone mark missile because they weren't really welcome in Canada. And that was the main debate because mm -hmm. by 63, uh, uh, and so the whole debate was on should we acquire the nuclear warheads for the bone mark? Because I feel like a deeper bigger government wanted technological advancements, but they didn't want to get too involved in the actual aspect of doing nuclear attacks against other countries. Yeah. It was mainly like we have a weapon, don't attack us, but we're not necessarily inclined to attack you, meaning yeah. the Soviet Union. So yeah, it was it was it was definitely it was highly debatable. Mm -hmm. So they kinda Canada kinda wanted to be prepared in case something happened but they didn't want to provoke anybody at the same time? Yeah, like, like we weren't launching Sputnik into space or anything. We, we didn't have many technological achievements. We were kind of hiding behind the umbrella of the United States. And then we had our little thing within the umbrella that we were trying to develop as well. Yeah. Um, kind of looking more at um, modern wars, I guess, and modern defense. 
Um, you say we were kind of hiding behind the veil of the United States back then. What's your opinion on people that still think we're kind of hiding behind the veil of the United States today? Well, I feel like these days there's so much going on. So it's kind of basically forgot with COVID and the Black Lives Matter protests. I feel like they completely forgot about the other issues. You know, there's so much, for example, last year developing I think like a Mark 8 rocket. So we've come a long way. And then we all have our big, you know, lines that we, like in terms of metaphorically, like the United States, China, and North Korea, the global superpowers. And you, you can do, you know, mean threats, but in order to, if they actually acted and launched those missiles, then they could, you know, basically destroy the world. So I feel like it could happen, but right now with everything else going on, it's, it's, there's probably a low probability that it will happen out of the blue. Mm -hmm. I feel like political tensions and tariffs that apply, especially economical factors, do contribute to rising issues as well. Um, did you have the chance to use any primary sources during your research, or was it mostly secondary? Um, yeah, it was mostly secondary sources, but I found a few, uh, for example, all the images that I used as backdrops for my PowerPoint, those were all from the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. um, from the U.S. National Archives database and the Library of Archives Canada. And the one dark that I have in the chat, that one, it's probably my best timing source that I found. It's the only textual document that's digitized. Because obviously I couldn't go to Ottawa <laughs> yeah. in the circumstances. And there's very few documents in library. They are not that great digitizing stuff. Library not just Canada. Mm -hmm. I say like 80% of the documents were not digitized. Um, do you so, yeah. Yeah. Do you think you had a change of perspective um, about your topic? when, like, before you started researching it till after you started researching it? Um, when I started researching, I did not know I would come across the bone rock missile. And I, I, I often didn't know how, how much of an issue and actually, uh, how, much, how many ripples it said through Canadian politics. Because after we canceled the ILO, we, we said, you know, there was a computer system that would help with radar identification. And that paired with the speed of the bone rock that um, so easily surpassed the ILO. But then when it came to installing them, uh, for example, we saw a really cool, this NORAD bunker in North Bay, Ontario, which is actually an underground complex that could withstand a blast 280 times the accumulation mark during World War II. Um, I feel like when it came to that, the government took a step back and said, whoa, you know, th these are small towns and we're installing, installing these missiles, these big, you know, nice missiles that, you know, if they fail or if we launch them, they put the Soviets, I'm probably gonna launch it back at us. Mm -hmm. And then they also feel that what would be the public response? You know, should they keep it under the radar? Well then we'll resurface in the future. You know, we installed missiles with nuclear warheads and you know, people aren't gonna feel safe in a town. Like if they installed nuclear warheads downtown that into that downtown they I'm sure that nobody would be pleased mm -hmm. with that. So if you have a little town for the North Bay in Ontario, the C B C documentary said, you know, everyone went ballistic when they realized that they were going to be warheads and salt. So that's why the government recalled them. And it literally became a you know, scrap piece of metal, these bone rocks. Mm -hmm. So then in the end, the bone rock was just as worse, or even more worse than the era. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that people would be a little frightened if there were warheads in their town, especially if it was a smaller town um, back then. Um, yeah. Do you agree with what they ended up doing to the Avro Arrow, or do you think they should have used it or sold it um, just to have a different outcome with it? I mean, protocols are protocols. Like, if it's a confidential project, they're going to have to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And then Deacon Bacon's so called said he wasn't aware of the destruction in an interview after it was cancelled. And then, the, but the whole thing was, is that there were 15,000 workers that worked on the Apple email project. I mean, when it was canceled, there was there were no, you know, like C R B like we're getting right now in COVID. It was, yeah. it was literally just like hop in your car or if you have a car and then just leave the plant. And that was it. And then with the rise of Apollo in the United States, and they were starting, you know, after Sputnik developed satellites, a lot of them just went directly to the United States. So I feel like the, the and then 
what happened is that the ones that stayed were actually forced to destroy the plane that they made. Mm-hmm. They were forced to destroy the plane that they made. So that was a big issue. And I believe it was England or European countries that reached out to us later on, according to a 1989 book that I read. And the government said that the plane was not available for sale. When in reality, it had already been sold to various junkyards across, across Ontario because it was built in most of Ontario. I can't imagine working so hard on developing the airplane and then the government comes up and says you have to destroy it and you've been working forever trying to do this. I think it'd be yeah. quite a broken yeah. people. Yeah, because like the, the, the workers kind of had a warning. There was like this buffer zone um, clear between 50 and 59. Because it was cancelled, I think, February 20th, 1959. And there was this buffer zone 58. They said, okay, we see the light of intercontinental ballistic missiles. In the report that I shared in the chat uh, to the defense, like the defense ministry, it says that they believe that the threat of uh, bombers would be erased by 1965. The document itself was written in C1, I think. Um, so, based on that, I feel like it was, it wasn't the wrong, dis- I feel like, it, it wasn't the wrong, I don't know, like, we, 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 it might have been the good decision to keep it. For example, just for reconnaissance, if you just have a threat or the radar system fails, it, it, it could nearly match the speed of the bomber. Mm-hmm. So the only real difference is that it might take a bit more time to initialize. The bomber had a more complex radar system. But in terms of brute speed and missiles, because the arrow had um, air deployable missiles, which were short, shorter ones, but it's still at the same velocity and destructive capability. And it was also, like I said, it had less of an impact than the bomber on the people because it would just be an airfield, probably quite remote. And then it wouldn't, you know, it would still be loud and it would still be known. But at least it wouldn't carry a nuclear warhead. Or at least if it didn't have nuclear missile, missiles, it would be far away from the town when, when they were deployed. Mm-hmm. Um, I read on your slideshow that one of the innovations that was used on the Avro Arrow was um, carrying the weapons on the bottom of the plane rather than on the wings. Um, was there any other kind of big innovations at that time that were implemented on the Avro Arrow, or was that kind of the main one? Um, when the, when the, so when the the Cold War, they started doing more complex testing for the aircraft, obviously. It was more, despite all the time pressure that were felt, you know, to develop it. For example, you know, they did wind tunnel tests and stuff, and they stimulated flying environments. Mm-hmm. And they also had to look at the parts. For example, there was a, probably one of the most fastest engines of the t- most, more pa- most powerful engines of the time, mm-hmm. which is called the Iroquois engine, or I think it's, let me just check here, I R I. Q O I R O Q U O I S Iroquois engine. And so at the beginning they used I think it was called Pratt and Win Winley, which was an American engine. Um but when the you know, it's like fifty eight they started they used it they used this Iroquois engine. It was actually solely developed for the Alpha Arrow. Mm-hmm. So that's what allowed it to surpass speed of Mark II. And obviously, since we thought it was our only shot, or at least our only shot at that time period, there was a lot of taxi trials. Everything was very rigid. You know, for example, this day, you know, we would test speed, and then we would test range, or we would test turning, landing, taking off, etc. Yeah, but the Iroquois engine was a really cool feature, especially since I feel it was so really developed for the Alpha Arrow, and it was bloody huge if you look at size. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. Uh, what was the most interesting piece of information you learned? The most interesting piece that I learned is that I feel like I was just completely shocked that there was nothing given to the wolves because the plane looked cool. It, it had good capabilities, but yet they treated it as if it was nothing. And then they literally told the workers, you know, by saying go home and you don't have any, you don't have any benefits that you can receive in order, you know, for the loss. You know, them, you know they just come fresh from the university, or they've been experienced, they have been, or they have previously been working for the company, mm-hmm. the AV company. 
So when it was cancelled, I say that they they were just they were, they, they didn't feel good at all. They they they, they said this is all you can give us. You know, you say we make a good plane, you say it's fast, and then you suddenly turn on us and say, oh, it's not good enough because of the missile. You know, how are we supposed to know that the missile is a threat? You know, the defense ministry. All we are are the workers that assemble what you tell us to make. So kind of they are us. And they're just sending us home without any help. It's just completely, completely disrespectful because you call the shots, and then we we can't leave them out. So if you just leave us hanging, you know, we're, we're definitely going to go to the United States. Don't expect us to stay. Um. So lots of what we talked about this past weekend and kind of highlighted in our community doc documentary was the change between working on heritage fair projects before COVID and then after COVID. So do you think your project or how you presented your project changed because of the situation with COVID? Um, I feel like, I feel like it, I definitely gave me more time. I did a bit more research since mm -hmm. um, I did, I looked a bit more into the databases because I actually, really, I did not use Library Archives Canada, so I found a lot of the documents and photos during March break and into April, May, and maybe a bit early June. So yeah, you definitely gave me more time to do a bit more of my own research. And I also, I, 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 I completely forgot about the project until the initial email I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great you had more time, because sometimes just that little bit of extra time can really take your project even further. Yeah. Um, I guess, is, is there any other things we haven't covered about your project that you want to talk about? Um, there, I think I'll just, I'll talk, now, uh, like, do you need to go? No, I have lots of time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, but I want, like, the Beaumont missile, I, I'm going to admit, it, it was a good, it was a good te technological achievement. The U.S. had, they probably had a lot more companies under their hand and lead it. So they commissioned Boeing to, to build this. And it was a ramjet power missile, which means that it is fired out of a silo. And it was controlled by the Sage, which is developed by MIT and IBM. Mm -hmm. And it was super cool because the thing is, the computer itself, our computers right now, I don't know, let's see, they're probably about 50 centimeters in length. And then they have this, two millimeter thick screen. Yeah. And the stage computer, just to let you know, it was the size of an apartment building. Mm -hmm. It was literally a concrete box that was placed in the middle of nowhere. And what would happen is it was this huge computer. And then at the beginning of the day, there would be these disks, like kind of like hard drives that would be, that would be put in with the air you know, traffic that would be coming. And then there would be these individual people at these screens. And and then what would happen is if the computer detected a plane that was not in the system, then they would appear on these box shaped screens. And then they would use something called a light gun, which literally looks like a gun that's connected to a cord. And they would like touch it, like boink it. And then they would tell the computer to track it and it would show an X, which is where they would fire in order to meet the target at its current trajectory speed. And then they would consult with the general and just simply make sure that it wasn't a plane that was you know, behind schedule because they, they did not want to kill innocent Americans, that was for sure. Mm -hmm. And then once they realized that it was a foreign target, they would give the command and it would be fired. So it was pretty complex given that we can just do it out of push of a button now. Mm -hmm. But that, that was something cool. And then what I also learned at is looking at a, um, looking at a document, the one in the chat, I realized that there was actually a two, there was actually an agreement between the US and Canada, which we hadn't found at all. And instead, the government had a document that there was a two-way agreement that we would have to build at least two two Boma sites in Canada mm -hmm. in order for the U.S. to be satisfied. Because they, they have given us the technology, and the cost was seventy-five million dollars around, which was discussed in the, on in the document, which was a lot less than the AWOL. The AWOL was forty million dollars, and the thing was that so it was a lot cheaper. But basically, what would happen is that we couldn't afford to not um, abide by that agreement or else, especially during the Cold War when, when we were leaning on them for support. 
So that was a cool thing that I found. And one, yeah, and that was that was basically it that I had. Wow. Yeah, just you a little thing about the safe computer. So knowledgeable about this, I'm amazed. Um, have is this your first heritage fair project, or have you done them before? Um, I did one last year on the downtown east side. Okay. So how do you think you've learned any research skills from doing this project that you can um, use in the future? Um, I feel like I, 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 I use a lot of, I feel like I, I already knew how to use these databases, like the US National Archives and the Library of Arts Canada. But I, I, I really, I feel like the, the break allowed me and COVID allowed me to take advantage of them more. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I definitely, because last year I only used the city of Vancouver archives since the downtown east side is in Vancouver. So I feel like since this, this was a national issue, I, it was, I had to use different databases and now I'm more familiar with multiple databases. So yeah, mm -hmm. it was cool. I, I, like, I, I don't think I want to phone to Ottawa, but who knows. Maybe you also get to go there one day and you can even dive into your research further. Yeah. What do you think Canada as a country or um, the government can learn from what happened with the Avro Arrow? I feel like they can learn to really, you know, like if you had that moment, if you had hired 15,000 workers and if you had, you know, that big aircraft company at your fingertips, and I think there were like 750 contractors or subcontractors that they had. It was crazy. And if you have that all your fingertips, like just don't lose it. If right. you spent time on research and money, the biggest thing is money because the work revolves around money. If you have spent all of that, and just don't lose it because you, you know you've you've made big decisions. You know, do we want this company? Do we want the type of money? Like, do we want? Do I mean, do we want the type of materials? Do we want aluminum? You know, what's more lightweight, what, like, what's more efficient? You know, if we spend all the features and then we cancel it and we destroy it, you know, we're losing so much. Mm -hmm. So, like, since we completely destroyed the ammo, we were literally where we, like, in 1961, we were, where, we were where we were in 1951 because we had completely destroyed the ammo. And we literally, the government had, you know, their goal was just completely forget about it and start over, which is a completely... That was a completely flawed mindset continuing that the Avro Ill had potential. Definitely. It'd be, yeah, I hope that wouldn't happen again. And it's a great lesson for the government and everybody else um, just regarding the development of technology. Um, is there one, I guess, project um, technology, like in technology, that's being worked on right now in Canada or internationally that you're really passionate about? A project in Canada. Um, I think there was, there's a, there is a project and I feel one project that I was looking at recently is there's this, I think you might have heard of Logan project, you interviewed Logan. Yeah. I think Logan on Saturday. Yeah. Logan's my friend. We go to the same school. Oh yeah. Um, and he was looking at Sandin, mm -hmm. and then there's, uh, there's like the powerhouse there, which is from 1897, and there's only a few residents. And I thought it was really cool. There was a global nail video, and Sandin, obviously, there was a mining and the silver in the late 1800s. And then there was also, they actually just dumped some land and buses there in 1965. Mm -hmm. So on BC Electric buses, because it was a ghost town, and it was literally a big junkyard. And now the the one of the few residents there wants to send wants to sell the energy from the 1897 powerhouse, which is still running and producing energy, which is pretty cool. And the equipment's all original. He wants to sell that energy to BC Hydro, and wow. then that that money will facilitate the restoration of Sandin. And I thought that's really cool. That'd be great using that technique. Yeah, because they were, and then yeah, because they have no funding otherwise. So that's really the only means. Wow. Do you think researching the Avroero has kind of inspired you to pursue more education or like a career way in the future, um, either in like aviation or computer sciences? Um, I think, like, I think I probably want to pursue something in 
I kind of want to work out to see if they can archives when I'm older. Okay. I might, or, or something in the research field. Uh, because I, I find it interesting that we, we don't really use the resources, right? Like, we have all these digitization projects, but a lot of time is spent, I'm not going to say wasting time, but, you know, like, YouTube and stuff, and all the time spent the internet and everything, and I feel like it's a pity that these things are also on advertised. Like, you, these databases, like, it's, it's hard to come across them if you don't, you know, if they aren't recommended, or unless, you know, you do a history project and you, and you look up, you know, resources that you can mm -hmm. use. I think I think I definitely want digitization. I think, or uh, maybe just did, did, um, archives to do some digitization, because yeah, it definitely looks like a lot of the archives kind of could use some digitization projects. Mm -hmm. Cover basically everything. This is one quick last thing that um, it also affected badly on us because we were in NATO, and NATO was created in '49, and then the fact that we cancelled the project. We I think we we use a lot of we probably borrowed a bit from NATO or. They, they were, I think we saw with nine countries, and now it's almost, you know, they're definitely over 15. So since we had that in the United States, we were really, like, tied to multiple multiple organizations, and it just overall reflected quite negatively. Mm -hmm. Like, if we had acquired them more and the citizens would have been fine, and that might have been better. But then even reflecting back, people would have eventually gotten angry that, you know, we charged the arrow and the workers would have retaliated. But I feel like since, since the whole project received negative attention, Mostly the workers are fine with that, and they just moved to the U.S. Mm -hmm. on. So yeah. Okay. Well, it was awesome talking with you, and thanks for sharing your project. Okay. Thanks. Bye, Oliver. Bye.